Oh, Here at Bitcoin yeah. Wednesday, we're talking to Fred Serkos from IBM, and he uh, is basically uh, a lead developer of Hyperledger. You're doing all kinds of interesting uh, projects with yeah. cars, etc. Uh, first, talk about Hyperledger. What uh, I, we know a little bit from the Linux yeah. uh, Foundation, and there's different uh, versions of uh, Hyperledger. Eh? What, what are the main versions of Hyperledger? Yeah. Um, so Hyperledger is an open source Linux backed up project, yeah. which has multiple projects involved inside of it. Um, the most of the time that I'm involved, it's um, Hyperledger Fabric, which is a permissioned um, blockchain technology. Uh -huh. um, currently, it's on 1.4, version 1.4, which is going to be long-term support. support. Yeah. And you uh, say it's a, it's a permission-based. That means uh, it's a network of computers, but you be, before you're allowed to be part of the network and uh, be part of the... Uh, of the solution, you have to be approved by uh, in some kind of a way by the network. Yes, that is true. Um, so the difference between a permission and public blockchain network is that in a public network, you can join the network anytime you want without actually introducing yourself to the network. But in a permissioned uh, blockchain network, you have to introduce yourself to the rest of the participants to be able to actually yeah. transact in the network. Normally, the ones you're involved in, do you have 10 participants, 100 or 1,000? Uh, it depends. depends on the use case. Yeah, but uh, I mean, but so what is normal? Um, so the Hyperledger Fabric um, architecture yeah. thing is that um, organizations usually transact in network, not individuals. Yeah. So it's usually 20, 10 organizations, yeah. maximum 50. And do they have maybe. one computer per organization or two or three or five or it uh, doesn't uh, matter? So we have something called peers in network. Yeah. Um, the peers are uh, basically endorsing the transactions, simulating the transactions based on smart contracts. Yeah. Our organization can have 50 peers or it can have one based on how much... And what is your experience so far? Is one computer per uh, organization enough? Um, no, no, it's not. Uh, yeah, because scale up, you can scale up as you introduce more peers into the system. Because how many transactions per second is, uh, is easy in, 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 in small, uh, with small amount of nodes? Uh, it depends on the uh, endorse, endorsing peers, but um, we know that based on research, it's 1,000 transactions per second and up. To 3,000 transactions per second. Yeah, there's no problem uh, to do that. Uh, okay, g give me some use cases. What uh, what what kind of uh, cases have you have you worked on? Uh? Um, one of the use cases could be um, automated supply chain. So you can track and trace the automated the, 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 the cars. Yeah. The car are getting a digital twin, uh, are getting yeah. an identity on the network, and, uh, yeah, and basically yeah. you can you can start by tracing where it's been produced, yeah. uh, manufactured until where it's dying was demolished. Mm -hmm. So the whole process can be actually tracked and traced down the blockchain with each um, document being post posted by different companies in the, yeah. in the whole. So that's interesting. That's a Copemont case, right? A logistical company which yeah. took all the uh, cars from uh, all the OEMs all over yeah. Europe. Yeah. And that's now a consortium. There's more Copemonts who are doing that now, yeah? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, that is okay. pretty much Another right. example? Um, another example is Mar Marsk. Um, yeah. which is the containers track and trace. So it's again, supply chain. Yeah. Uh, supply chain is pretty popular blockchain. Popular. Also, yeah, also... We, tra we trade is also an we example. Trade. We trade is not supply chain, though. We trade is no. financial services. Financial services yeah. Multiple banks um, settling the transactions on a, on a blockchain network. Yeah. Hey, and uh, what is your role at IBM? What do you do? Are you a developer? Or are you a yeah. project manager? Or uh, uh, do you write code? Do you know how to write code? Is it Ethereum or, or in, in general? Yeah, I'm a lead developer in IBM, mm -hmm. um, also a technology consultant, so both here and there. I did some architectural work too, um, but yeah, of course I do write code. Uh, that is my main job, so if I, when I go to work, I write yeah. code. So you, do you also know public, uh, public uh, blockchains like Ethereum and how to write contracts in that? Yeah, I wrote, I wrote, well, it's personal time though. I wrote Solidity, um, looked at Bitcoin, there's the smart contract as I, f I know, as, as far as I know. But yeah, I've worked on Ethereum a little bit here and there. Yeah. And then I looked into how Ethereum is actually getting interoperability with Hyperledger Fabric. So how to run Ethereum Solidity smart contracts on Hyperledger Fabric. Oh, you can just take an uh, Ethereum yeah, uh, smart easy. contract and just... <laughs> It's compatible now. It, it accepts um, the language. A little bit. So they're trying. It's a, it's to a project. It's a pro yeah, it's POC. It's a yeah. Project. And what do you think is the difference now between Hyperledger or Ethereum? If you see those two developing, you know, you see that From one organization has thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, developers, and it's totally open, and the other one is more enterprise and and uh, enterprise and has hundreds of developers. 
Um, from a developer point of view. Yeah, what is the, do you see one de developing much faster than the other, or uh, is it... Uh um, let's say like this. Um, from a developer point of view, writing code, especially Solidity, yeah. was a little bit hard from my side because you have to take into consideration how much gas you're using when you're writing um, your smart contract. While in the Hyperledger Fabric, there is no gas. There is no something that you don't... S there's nothing to spend. Yeah. So it's much more... Um, easy to write code, and it's also the you do Java script, right? Right. I mean, or, or TypeScript, JavaScript, Java. Yeah. Um, what else? Golang. Yeah. So a lot of opportunities. So and, uh, it is not an easy language. Uh, the Ethereum. Uh, the tools are not. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the the idea behind it. It's not the language itself, but the idea that you have to watch out how many executions that you do on your smart contract is a little bit different than where you can just write freely. It's like C. I don't know if you ever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so in C, you have to take care of your memory allocations. It's kind of like that in Solidity. Okay, so how do you think those two uh, platforms will develop in the future? Will Ethereum eat up uh, Hyperledger uh, or will Hyperledger eat up Ethereum? No, I think from, from what I see, what I, from my experience, I think the no one's going to eat up no one. It's going to be a collaborative um, blockchain networks of networks at the end of the day. No one's going to dominate no one. Yeah. You have to run to catch your train to go to oh the yeah. client back. Thank yeah. you very much. This was Bitcoin Wednesday yeah. or about Hyperledger. That's unique that at Bitcoin Wednesday, Hyperledger and Enterprise Solutions was there because I think uh, that's the first time in yeah. 66 uh, edition. The Enterprise is here.